All right, everyone here I see that's here tonight was here this morning. So you got to hear the, the first, really the first part of this sermon. This is the, the second part in a two-part series. Uh, this morning I was, I was preaching on the truth about the Jews. And um, from the world's standpoint, it, would, it sounded like it would probably be a really harsh sermon, but it's just the truth. It's what the Bible teaches. It's, it's fact. It's, it's what the religion teaches. It's an antichrist religion. But I want to go a little bit deeper tonight and go into the time my sermon tonight is called God's Chosen People because this is where a lot of people get messed up. A lot of Christians and Christianity in general out there, your, your average Christian church has, I think, a, a misguided understanding of, of who the Jews even are. And you could read a lot of passages where, you know, they are God's chosen people. And you could see that over and over in the Bible. We're going to see, understand, what does that mean? What does it mean for them to have been chosen? What was the purpose for that? Well, you know, what, what does it mean and, and where, where are they at today? Where is the standing today? So we're going to see, we already saw, you know, a lot this morning about, about where they're at right now. But we're going to see kind of what leads up to that. So we started in Genesis 17 because basically... When it comes down to God's chosen people, everything starts with Abraham. You know, before Abraham, you have, you have Adam and Eve and, you know, and, all, and the whole history before that, but nobody was like a chosen group or a chosen person or anything in particular all the way up to this point. Really, we're starting with Abraham here. And we see the, the covenant is given to him and it's, um, he's given circumcision as a token of that covenant, of that promise that was made unto Abraham. Look down at verse number 4 here in Genesis 17. Power is as for me behold my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. So we see here God blessing Abraham, God promising to Abraham that there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of uh, progenitors after him, a lot of people that are descended basically from his loins. And at this point, Abraham still was without Isaac. He still was without his son that was promised to him by God. And we see, you know, later on in this chapter how he's like, well, I'm really old. What do you mean I'm going to have a child, right? But it's the child of promise, and I'm not even going to get into that. That's a whole nother sermon going into the child of, of promise versus the child of the flesh, which was Ishmael. But um, we see here, this, this is the beginning where God's basically choosing Abraham and saying, you know what, of you... Starting with you and your children, the people who come forth after you and after you and after you, it starts with Abraham. You have Isaac and Jacob, right? Jacob becomes Israel, and Israel has 12 sons, and that's the 12 tribes, you know. And, and even before they become like tribes, that's when they go into Egypt, and, uh, you know, for, the, for the, the famine that was in the land, and Joseph sustains them all. Then, they, you know, hundreds of years later, they're, they're in bondage. God brings them out about, you know, the, the whole story, right? But it all starts back with Abraham and God blessing him. This is where, this is, you know, God's chosen person, if you will, is Abraham. God made a promise to, Ab to Abraham where his seed was going to be blessed and they're going to have this land and he's going to be their God and they're going to be his people. This is where it starts. Now flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 12. Because we see Abraham was really, the covenant was given to him here in chapter 17. He was called out by God in Genesis chapter 12. And this is where, and I want to spend just a few minutes on chapter 12 because this is where a lot of false doctrine comes from. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse number 1. Bible reads, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, 
Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So God's calling him out of his home. He's dwelling at home. He's with his family. And God's saying, look, Abram, I want you to pick up and I want you to go into a country that I shall show you. So Abraham is, is um, looked at later on as, you know, having great faith. And you look at Hebrews 11 and you see, you know, he's acknowledged as he had great faith back when he didn't know where he was going. God just called him out, said, oh, time to go. And what did Abraham do? He went up and left. He had faith in God that, you know what, I don't need to know where I'm going. I'm just going to follow you, God. And this is one of the reasons why God chose him and God loved him so much. And he was considered a friend of God because he had great faith. He believed in the Lord. But he, tell, he calls him out here, verse 1, and then verse 2, it says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So this is, this is God, you know, blessing Abraham and telling him, and look, this is a conversation between God and Abraham. And this gets so destroyed and misapplied these days. He's telling him, I'm going to bless them that bless thee. Now, one of the great things about having a King James Bible is that it hasn't gotten rid of the these and the thous. Amen. This is what all the modern translations are going to try to tell you as why it's such a good translation. We got rid of those these and thous and everything else. But do you know why it's so important? It's because when they change the thee and the thou to just you, you have no idea whether it's you singular or you plural because you could use you for both instances. In the King James Bible, there is a difference. Thee and thou is one person. It's singular. He's talking to one man. Ye and you, it's plural. It's multiple people. Very simple. It's a great design for the language. It's a shame that we lost that in our modern language, or modern English. But... Um, so when God says, I will bless them that bless thee, he's talking about Abraham. This does not say, I will bless them that bless your children or your inheritance or your seed or anything like that. He says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, look at this, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Not one nation, not one group of people, but all families of the earth be blessed through Abraham. And why is that? And I'm just going to let, let the cow bag right now. The reason why is because the promise and the covenant and the whole point of him being chosen is because that is who Jesus Christ was going to be born from in that lineage. God had chosen him to be the, the great, 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 great grandfather of Mary, right? Of whom Jesus was going to be born in the flesh. That's the point. And, that, and that's how all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed because Jesus is the only one that, that can provide such a blessing to all the families of the earth because salvation is available to every person regardless of where you're born, whatever your ethnicity is. All you have to do is believe on the Lord and that is a blessing. So that's what we see in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Or excuse me, 12 verses 1, 2, and 3. But today, you know, people say, oh, we got to bless Israel. We got to bless that nation of Israel that was... Founded in, in 1940, whatever, by the, by the United Nations and became a state when they didn't return to God. They still have the same religion. Nothing changed about their beliefs about Jesus Christ. They were brought back into that land and, and created this nation called Israel. And now all of a sudden we're told, well, we've got to bless them or else God's hand's going to be against us. Well, take a step back for a minute and say, you know, look at what the United States has done. If we just want to look at this and prove this scripture, is this talking about Israel? Is this talking about the, the modern day nation of Israel? Well, let's just see the proof is in the pudding. The United States has been blessing Israel since its foundation as a country in recent years, right? And, and ever since the 1940s, the United States has been providing militaries, arms, aid, you know, finances, all kinds of stuff. They have been blessing Israel. Even the, the stinging Christian churches have been blessing Israel. Is America any better off now as opposed to in the 40s? I mean, look at our morality. Look at what's going on. I mean, 
Even financially, right? Do we just have so many more blessings now? You know, look at our debt. Look at the national debt that we have right now. Look at the trouble in the economy. We're, we have so many problems going on right now. Does it look like it's God's blessing? Absolutely not. This is not talking about some man-made, created state of Israel. That God didn't bring them back into Israel because he still had them scattered because they still haven't turned back to him. Because that's been his plan all throughout Scripture. And you read that for yourself. I'm not going to prove that to you tonight. You can read that if my people, which are called by my name, you know, humble themselves and they return and they repent and they come back to me and they call on me, then I'll bring them back. Then I'll hear. That hasn't happened. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. So I just wanted to clear that up real quick. It's the whole sermon's not about that. I, again, even that one verse there in verse 3, I did that. We, I already did a Bible study going through Genesis. If you want to hear more about that, I went more in depth on my Genesis chapter 12 uh, Bible study. But I want to, we got a lot to get through, so I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to see why was Israel the chosen people? Why, why was, excuse me, why did God choose them for his name? Look at verse number 6 in Deuteronomy 7. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So God has singled out a group of people. This is very biblical, right? God said, I am going to choose this people. This is the group that I want to choose out and set them apart from everyone else in the whole world. Verse number seven, the Lord did not, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all the people. He says he didn't choose you because you were just some great, mighty kingdom. And God says, yes, this is a dominant kingdom and I'm going to use them to be my lighthouse and, and who I'm going to choose to work with. He says, no, actually, you are the least of all the people. You are very small. And see, God all throughout history, God loves doing this, taking that which is weak, taking the small, taking, taking people who don't have that much and lifting them up because he gets all the glory and all the credit and all the honor for that. And that's what we're seeing here. That is one of the reasons why God chose Israel here. But let's keep going here. Verse number eight. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your father. See, this goes all the way back to the oath of Abraham. And then the oath was reiterated to Isaac and Jacob. God still has to keep his promise. God is a God that's a God of his word. We can believe God in everything he says because he comes through every single time. It says, uh, he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse number nine. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. And I just realized there was one thing that I forgot to mention all the way back in Genesis 17. You don't have to turn there. But at the end of the passage we're reading in verses 8 and 9, I'm going to reread them for you. It says, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, I will be their God. And see, what happens is a lot of people these days will say, see, we have to put Israel there because that's their possession. God gave it to them forever as an everlasting possession. But you have to read the next verse in verse 9, which we did read, but I just want to make a point of that. Because God makes his promises and his promises are sure and his promises will stand forever. But see, the covenant that he made here wasn't just one-sided. There were two sides to this coin. There was still conditional. There was still something that they had to do in order to keep their end of that covenant. Right. Verse 9 says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, and thy seed after thee in their generations. See, the reason why the, the, the physical seed of Abraham today have no uh, claim to that land is because they didn't keep the covenant. Right. 
Had they been keeping the covenant of God, the covenant that was given to Abraham, this covenant, the holy covenant he made, and they were able to keep the laws and be obedient and follow and do what the Lord said, God would stay you know, for everlasting. He'd stay sure to his word. The problem is they broke that covenant. And as a result of breaking that covenant, no longer is that land their eternal inheritance. It's gone. It's done. And this is what a lot of people just fail to realize is that it wasn't just some gift given. It was a, it was a covenant. It was an agreement. Turn, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. We've got a lot of Bible to turn to today. So I'm, I might, you know, forgive me if I go a little bit quick, but I've got a lot of material and trying to get through everything. This is a very important topic. And I want to prove everything from Scripture tonight that we're looking at. We're starting off a little slow, but it's going to pick up. We saw why Israel was chosen. They were small people. But, and God had also made promises unto, the, unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he needs to keep those promises. Verse, uh, 1 Chronicles 16, verse number 12. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Again, warning, be mindful. Remember the covenant that God gave you unto, you know, unto a thousand generations. He commanded even the covenant which he made with Abraham and of his oath unto Isaac and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when ye were but few, even a few, and strangers in it. And when they went from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. God does have protection over his people, and we see that here also. But his people are only his people when they're listening to him and doing what he tells them to do. And there's a difference between being a child of God and being his people because you're born again, because you're saved, as opposed to the whole group and the whole nation. And this is what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about the whole nation. This morning, I, I really went in depth on talking about the Jews Right? As a group, not as individuals, not as someone who gets saved, but as a group. Well, here, when we're looking at the chosen people, we're also talking about a group. And a little bit of a good background for, for what we're studying tonight. I preach a sermon called The Salvation of a Nation. God's requirements for a nation to be in good standing with him, for, for him to be the savior of that nation, is completely based on works, which is exactly opposite of the salvation of a soul, of an individual, that is completely based on grace and by faith. They're two different things, and we need to make sure that, that we keep those distinct. But when we're looking at a, a nation... The chosen people are going to be the people that are listening to him and doing his works. The chosen people, because your soul is born again, are those that just have faith. Um, I'm going to read for you from Psalm 33. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 65. Psalm 33, verse 11, the Bible reads, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation. Now we're talking about a nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now when we read through the Old Testament and we see the prophets, we see Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and, you know, and Moses and all his people. Were the people generally following the Lord? They were, right? When, when they built the temple, when they would sacrifice in the temple. Now, they would have their times where they'd kind of stray and go away as a group, as a whole. They would kind of fall away and kind of go towards idols, but they'd come back and serve and worship the Lord. This is the way it was within the nation. They served the Lord. Well, let me ask you, 
Today, because it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Today is physical Israel. If you were to take a, a trip into Israel, are you just going to be running around and finding just tons of people who believe in Jesus Christ? No. Nope. Did you know it's not even allowed, it's not even legal to be proselytizing for Jesus Christ in modern day Israel? So let me ask you this. If that's the case, is their God the Lord? No. Nope. No. We saw that this morning. We saw that you can't have the Father unless you have the Son. Amen. They're Antichrist. They don't have the Lord. They don't have Jehovah because they don't have Jesus Christ. You can't have one without the other. They don't have them at all. So, are they blessed? No. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And if you want to know why America was ever so great, it's because this was a nation that promoted the Lord and Jesus Christ and that as a whole, as a group, was, had respect unto the words of God. That's why. We've reaped tons of blessings as a result. But guess what? Just as the Jews lost their place as being the nation that the Lord has blessed, it's going to happen here, and it can happen anywhere else when you reject God's word. That's why he says, blessed is the nation, whatever nation that may be. It doesn't have to be specific to any nation. Any nation that rises up and says, we're going to follow the Lord, that nation's going to be blessed of God. He's not a respecter of persons. God doesn't care where you were born from. He doesn't care what part of the world you were born, who your parents was, who their parents was, who their parents was. doesn't matter to God. You're a soul. You're an individual. God cares about you, every single individual. Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65 is a great reference prophesying of Jesus and how the servants of God are his people and the people that have turned to other gods are not his people. So let's see. I don't... I do with time. I'm like, I was going to go through, I'm not going to go through this entire chapter. There's so much in this chapter. I have in my notes, I could go through this entire chapter if I have enough time. We don't have enough time. I've got a lot of pages of notes. But I want to point out some specific things here in Isaiah 65. And, and mark that down and read it later tonight or tomorrow, sometime that when it's still fresh in your mind, to see how much is here. Look at verse number 9 of Isaiah 65. Bob reads, and I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. And what I'm going to prove to you shortly, and I just want to keep you this in mind, is that Jesus is the elect, ultimately. There's many places the Bible talks about the elect and the election and who the elect are. It's not always talking about Jesus but more often than not, it is referring to Jesus Christ, the elect. And we're seeing here in this passage, Jesus Christ is that chosen one. You can have a chosen nation, you can have a chosen people, but Jesus Christ is the chosen one. He's the Savior. And this is, who, what is who's being referred to as bringing forth a seed out of Jacob. This is going to, Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the covenant and the promise made all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at verse number 11. So he says, well, actually, no, I'm going to keep reading here. Verse number, I'm going to reread verse number nine. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains and mine elect shall inherit it and my servants shall dwell there and Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in for my people that have sought me. So he's saying, this is going to be great, you know, his blessing for my people that have sought me. But look at verse 11. But ye are they that forsake the Lord. This is Isaiah preaching to Israel. To the children of Israel. You know, but you have forsaken the Lord. Ye are they that forsake me, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore, will I number you to the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. He did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, 
but ye shall be hungry. So he's pointing a difference between his servants and them. And my, again, the, the context is who he's talking to is the children of Israel. He said, my servants will be able to eat, but you are going to be hungry. They're going to be blessed, but you will not. Why? Because you've forgotten me. You've forsaken me. You're not doing this stuff anymore. Um, verse number 13, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. And what the point that I want to show you from even in the Old Testament is that God is explaining this isn't something that you just get just carte blanche that you're just my chosen people and you're just always going to be my chosen people and I'm just always going to bless you regardless of what you do. That's never been the case. It's always been conditional. It's always been up in the air saying, look, if you serve me, great. I've chosen you. I want you to serve me. I want you to do everything. But if you stop serving me, someone else I'm going to find that is serving me and they're going to be my people. This is not something that's set in stone. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. We saw already how God chose Abraham. Why? Because he obeyed him, because he had faith, because he followed him, because he was his friend, because he, he was ready and willing to listen and to do what God had for him to do. God liked that. God chose him. It was based on what he was doing. It was based on his actions and on his works. In addition to his faith, of course, he had to have that faith to even do those things. But God chose him for those reasons. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 15. We're going to see here Jesus, the chosen one. But when Jesus knew it, verse 15, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And his, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Again, the prophesying, this was going back, this is quoting Isaiah 42. And this is prophesying salvation coming unto the Gentiles and trusting in the Christ. Something that absolutely happened. And we're going to see here, well, I'm not even going to get to that, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. A synonym for, for a people being chosen is also the elect, and that's what we were looking at. So if you're chosen or you're elect, you know, we have an election for, for president, for other political offices. All it means is that the people are supposedly choosing you know, who they want to have in that office. That's what the election is for. It's to make a choice. The elect in the Bible is the same thing. God has chosen people for various reasons. He's chosen Jesus Christ to be the Savior. He's chosen Abraham to be the progenitor of Jesus Christ. He's chosen you know, the, his people Israel to be the, the, the nation and the group of people by which he was going to reveal his word. And he was going to reveal the plan of salvation. He was going to reveal himself unto. I mean, if you think about it, God has to, you know, as people began to multiply on the face of the earth and, and break into different nations... He has to choose somewhere. I mean, he could do whatever he wants, really, but he, he decided to choose one place to say, you know what? I, want, I still have a lot more to reveal unto mankind. They need to know more about me. So how am I going to reveal this unto people? Well, he decided to choose. Well, I'm going to start with someone here. Here's someone who's listening to me. Here's someone who's doing my works. I'm going to choose him. And I'm going to bless him. And I'm going to make, you know, he's real small. I'm going to make sure everybody sees the great power of God, my great power. And I'm going to demonstrate that I am the Lord, that I am the one true God. 
And he did that. And he chose a small group of people. He blessed them. He brought them through all these great trials and persecutions and did the great miracles and, and led them forth out of Egypt by all of the wondrous miracles that the whole world found out about and knew all about. The great miracles that were done, bringing them out of, the, out of the land, out of bondage, out of slavery, setting them free. He was a God of liberty and freedom. He chose a people to do that with, to make his name known. It makes sense. It makes sense that he did it that way. And because he gave us free will, you could, you know what? If you want to follow the Lord, go ahead. You could join yourself to be a part of Israel. You know, in these days, join yourself there. You could become a Jew. We saw that this morning in Esther. Many people of the land became Jews in Esther chapter 8 because they saw the great power of God. You could have done that at any time back then. Or you could have said, you know what? Forget this guy, the Lord. I'm going to go worship some other guy. I'm going to go worship Baal. I'm going to go join myself to the Philistines or whatever. You could have moved anywhere you wanted, especially that, you know, during that time frame, the, the whole globe wasn't necessarily settled, right? But um, anyhow, I'm not even going to get into that. 1 Peter 1, did I have you turn there? 1 Peter 1. We're going to start looking at verses that talk about the elect. And again, I'm not going to go super in-depth into this either. I preached an entire sermon that, that we went through like all of the, the New Testament usages of the word elect. But um, I just want to point out, first of all, the elect are not physical Jews. That is not the elect. When, we see, when you read the Bible and it says, you know, saying, oh, this is the elect, it's never talking about just the physical seed of Abraham. Right. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 1 here in 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, that word strangers, if you don't know what that is, that means foreigners. Yeah. It's a stranger. Now, you'll see in other epistles, to the brethren, right? James is to the brethren. Now, again, I believe that's just talking about believers, but you can make an argument saying, well, they were Jews, so it's to their brethren. This is specifically Peter, who was a Jew, to the strangers. Okay, you cannot make an argument against who he's talking about here. This is not talking to the Jews. Just want to point that out. 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Verse 2. It says, you know, he says, to the strangers, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He's calling the strangers elect. Right. It's not talking about physical Jews. I mean, right there, we have a very, very clear example that when you see the elect, they're chosen, but it's not because they're physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. It's because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, flip over to chapter 2. Verse number 6. But reads, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect. Now, who's the chief cornerstone? That's Jesus Christ, right? So here we have an example of the elect being Jesus Christ. Before he called the strangers elect, and now we see Jesus Christ being called elect. So you need to get it in context. I mean, here's that word again, context, right? Wouldn't it be a great thing if everybody could derive their, their doctrine in the context of the verses that we read it? But let's keep going here. Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Verse number seven, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation. Who's a chosen generation? The strangers. Ye. Ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. The strangers. We're comprising a holy nation. He's not referring to Israel as being the holy nation. Let this sink in. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past, verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. He's writing to people who says, right now, you are a holy nation. Right now, you are peculiar people. Right now, you are the people of God. Why? Because it's no longer Israel being the chosen people. 
it is moved it is transitioned it is no longer them and I'll tell you right now we're gonna to get to it a little bit later in the sermon we believe here is called replacement theology we don't believe that the physical Jews or any inhabitants of Israel today are God's magical chosen people that God is some racist that he cares what the genealogy is when the Bible says to avoid genealogies when the Holy Ghost said avoid genealogies have nothing to do with them you cannot convince me that God still cares who is of the tribe of Judah and who is of the tribe of Issachar and who is of the tribe of Zebulun over in Israel today it means nothing Colossians, so if you go to Colossians chapter 3. <coughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse number 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is, look at this, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision barbarian Scythian bond nor free but Christ is all and in all put on therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved bowels of mercies kindness humbleness of mind meekness long suffering goes on and on and again this is written to the people at Colossae not to the people in Israel the people of Colossae but um they are the elect of God and it says in Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew it doesn't matter. Look, if it mattered that someone was a Jew, then why would he say, well, there is neither Greek nor Jew? It doesn't matter. We don't need, there is no, and see, people will call me an anti-Semite, especially after this morning's sermon, but all I'm doing and all I believe and say is that I'm not going to elevate any one group of people over another one because that's what's happened these days. We have Christians that are elevating, escalating the status of a Jew above everyone else say oh well this is God's chosen people and they're better than everyone else because they have a twisted view or perception of what it even means to be a chosen people some people go as far as to thinking that because they're a Jew they get a you know, get into heaven free pass that somehow they could get saved and go to heaven around Jesus Christ that's blasphemy I mean that's ridiculous right. people that believe that I mean I don't even think they're saved Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. He doesn't care where you're born. Amen. He doesn't care who your father was. That's why the, the, the Bible teaches that everyone, every man shall be judged according to his own deeds and not the deeds of his father, not the deeds of his parents, not what his son does, what you do. You are judged on your own actions and your own works and your own beliefs. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And even in Romans 9, we saw Romans 10 this morning. I closed this morning's sermon with Romans 10. You know, it's, uh, my, my prayer is that you know, all Israel shall be saved. Right? That's, that's what the Apostle Paul said. And in Romans 9, he's basically saying the same thing here in verse number 3. And look, this is the attitude that we have. We don't just hate people who are physical descendants or live in that country of Israel just because they were born there. No. We hate the religion of Judaism. We hate the workers of iniquity. We hate the, we hate the, 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 the children of the devil that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. But we love the people to go out and try to give them the gospel. I mean, even just, it's funny, we were just, I was just mentioning this morning about how very, 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 very few people that are Jewish I've ever even been able to give the gospel to today. And of course, today, we have uh, Brother Joseph went out and, and actually had a conversation with a Jewish person. And it was a decent conversation, at least. He said, you know, he still didn't, it was like he was blinded, he didn't want to hear it, and, but he did allow him to give him some, some scripture. So that was incredible. But you know what? That is a rare occurrence. And I'm glad he had the opportunity. You know, hopefully, and this is, you know, my prayer is that hopefully for that man, that seed that was planted, that little bit, will grow into something. I hope that that guy gets saved. I really do, because he is not, you know, our physical enemy or something that we just need to tear down. We need to reach these people. 
Romans 9, look at verse number 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed for Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He was one of them. Physically, he was a Jew. He's like, I care about these people. I would, you know, if I could just give myself so that they could come to this realization and get saved, he's like, I would do it because I love them that much. Verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertaining the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Physically, God chose that people to be the adoption, the, you know, to bring the glory of God, to have those covenants and those promises that were made, to, um, to get, you know, they received the law of God. God gave them that law, and they, he gave them to do the service of the law, right? The Levites and the priests were the ones who were, like, right there involved in serving God. They received a lot. There was a good reason to be a Jew, right, physically. Like, it was a benefit. It was a plus in that sense that God was dealing with them directly. It doesn't mean that no one else could get saved. It doesn't mean that they just were automatically saved. But there was a benefit. It's just like there's a benefit today to being born into a Christian household where mom and dad are saved and they're going to raise. There's a great benefit to that. You're going to be receiving the word of God. Hopefully you'll be receiving the adoption from the father. You'll, you'll be getting these things. You're going to hear of the covenant and the promises made to you. It's an advantage. Just like it would have been an advantage to be growing up in Israel in these days when God is, is giving out his word. Verse 5, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So he starts off by saying, you know what, according to the flesh, I wish these people were saved. But now he's going to switch gears and say, you know what, them, these people who are Israel, who are of Israel, they're not all Israel. See, God has an Israel. He has his people in his mind. There is an Israel of God. There is a chosen people of God that consists of believers. But it has nothing to do with the physical. He says, they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. Verse 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. And we saw the reference that Jesus made this morning, right? Saying, you're of your, your, your father, the devil. He said, I know they're Abraham's seed, but you're not Abraham's children. Neither because they are, they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So the physical descendants of Abraham, they're not God's children. Right. There's nothing to do with it. Right. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Jump down to verse 25. I mean, there's so much to say about this. And it's, again, it's so clear from Scripture. Jump down to verse 25. As he saith also in Ozi, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. It's not just Israel, you know, Israel's claim just for all time and they could only be the ones called the, the, the people of God. No, actually they're not the children of God anymore. He just said that physical Israel, they're not all Israel which are of Israel. That they're not even the children of God. Verse 27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So again, He's not just discounting every single individual from that group of Israel. He's saying there's still a remnant. There's still a small number that shall be saved. He hasn't just completely cast every, you know, the, the entire nation of Israel didn't just go completely reprobate as far as every individual, kind of like Sodom did, where like every individual in Sodom was just done, you know? That didn't happen to physical Israel. There, but there was still a small remnant that shall be saved such as the Apostle Paul and the, the other disciples. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, 
We had been, and it's funny, I, I, was, I forgot that this was even, reference was even in here. But he says, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and been made like unto Gomorrah. He says, except for that remnant, except for that, that little bit that he left, he says, we would have been just like Sodom. We would have been just completely reprobate. 100%. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the, hand, uh, of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. Now, if you want to, if you get into a conversation, there's a lot of scripture we're going over tonight. If you want to show anybody this truth, you know, just kind of in a nutshell about the nation of Israel and the Jews and, and where we stand with that today, Galatians 3 is the one you need to remember. Right. Galatians 3 is just like mic drop. I mean, what are you going to do when you read, you read all of Galatians 3? It's like, there it is. Okay, we're going to review some of this today, or I mean, yeah, not the entire chapter, but um, a lot of it. This is the one where it really just makes it extremely clear. But there is such a mountain of evidence. That's why we're going through so much of this. Galatians 3, verse number 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. We've seen this already in the other chapters we, we were looking at, in Romans 9 and elsewhere. Those that have faith, God looks at them and says, you are a child of Abraham. Just as Jesus said, the physical seed, you weren't children of Abraham. Why? Because they didn't believe. Because they didn't have faith. But when you have faith, you're considered a child of Abraham. And that's who the covenant was made to and to his seed the seed of those that were like Abraham, those that had faith like Abraham. That's what God's talking about. It's not about the physical. Verse number eight. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. If you have faith in Jesus Christ today, guess what? You are blessed with faithful Abraham. Praise God for that. Jump down to verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For as written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, not the children of Israel. We don't need to bless them so that we can be blessed and all this other nonsense. The blessing of Abraham could fall upon the Gentiles. Why? Because they have faith. Because they believe. That's why it says the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we, O ye of Galatia, Gentiles, or wherever you're from, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one into thy seed, which is Christ. So when you want to go back and look at the promises made to Abraham, like we did a little bit earlier, didn't go too far into depth. I've done this before. The promise was made to Abraham and to Christ. It wasn't just for every single person who came out of the loins of Abraham, just for all time, forever and ever and ever. The promises were to Abraham, specifically, and then the promises were to Christ. Even the promise, you know, I'll bless them that bless thee, you can apply that to Christ. <laughs> God's going to bless them that bless Christ. And curse them that curse Christ the same way he did with Abraham. Right. But it's not with just some other physical group of people that, want, that are anti-Christ. 
Verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Jump down to verse number 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. If that doesn't tell you that the physical nation of Israel doesn't matter to God at all, I don't know what will. Yeah. Because it's literally just saying, look, if you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. That's it. If you have the faith, you're part of that. Those promises fall to you. You can rejoice in that. You get to receive those promises. There is no special anything on any physical group of people. Amen. It's those that believe. Turn if you go to Matthew 21. We're almost done. Matthew 21, and there, there's so much scripture. Like I said, it's, it's difficult to cram everything into even two sermons like I did this morning and tonight. There's so much evidence on this. If people just read their Bibles and let God teach them and just show them, hey, I'm not going to try to twist this stuff around to make it mean something else. I'm just going to believe what it says. Galatians 3 is powerful. If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. Case closed. Matthew 21, verse 33, Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that he, they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? This is Jesus Christ giving a parable, right? And it's not hard to figure out what he's talking about. <laughs> He's saying, there's a man, he owns this great land, and he has people working for him, his servants. He said, I need you to do this work. I'm going off into another country, and I'm coming back, but I need you to, to, to make sure that all my stuff is maintained, everything's taken care of, and you're doing the work for me. And as he's sending people to check up on him, sending servants, you know, tell them what to do, they're beating him up, they're killing him, they want nothing to do with him, Right? And then he finally sends his son. He's like, they're going to listen to my son. And they kill his son. They're thinking, hey, once the son's out of the picture, who else is this going to go to? We're going to steal that inheritance for ourselves. And, then, and now he's saying, okay, they killed his son. <laughs> What's going to happen when the Lord comes back to those people? That's what he asked the question. Verse 41, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. They got it right. Good answer. That's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to come. He's going to destroy his He's going to get him out of there. And he's going to put new people in that are going to do what he told them to do. Mm -hmm. That's the point of the parable. Let's keep reading. Verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, you know who he's talking to here? The Jews. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. 
And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You know who he's referring to when he says he keeps sending servants? He's referring to the prophets. He's referring to the men of God that were being sent unto the children of Israel and saying, Thus saith the Lord, obey God. And what did they do to him? They cast him in the prison. They were sawn asunder. They did all these things. Read Hebrews 11 and you'll see a summary of what's been happening to God's people that were sent to the children of Israel. His prophets trying to get through to him. Do my work. Do what I've told you to do. Until he finally sent his son, Jesus Christ. And as we saw this morning, who's responsible for killing Jesus Christ? The Jews. I came unto my own and my own received me not. Jesus Christ came as the son to his father's vineyard. They rejected him. They killed him. What's he going to do as a result? He's going to take away and give it to somebody else. Right. Jesus taught replacement theology. Amen. This is exactly what we believe. Amen. Jesus took away all the great things that came along with being a Jew, with you know, having God's word, having all this stuff given to you. And he gave it to someone else. That's what he did. I don't know why it's so hard to understand. I don't know why it's anti-Semitic or anything like that to just believe the Bible. It says what it says. Turn back, if you would, to Romans chapter 2. Just more evidence that today it doesn't matter. Again, we have no reason to elevate or escalate the status of being a Jew physically. Romans 2.28, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. God looks at the inward. He looks at the heart. He says, Are you a Jew? Oh, wait. I, yeah, I don't care who your ancestry was from. I'm going to look at your heart. Do you have faith? That's how he's going to determine if you're a Jew or not. Uh, Romans 3, verse number 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, I went over that before. There was an advantage to that. Because the oracles of God, the visions of God, the, the word of God came unto that people. Yeah, there's a great advantage to that. But it didn't make them automatically saved. Look at, jump down to verse number 9 then. It says, what then? Are we better than they? Right, we're Jews. Does that mean are we better than them? No, in no wise. They're not better than anybody. Why elevate them as if they are better than people? They're not better than anyone. No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. Look, everyone's a sinner. We're all in the same boat when it comes to that. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Jump down to verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith. Circumcision is the physical Jew. And uncircumcision through faith. What does that mean? God's going to justify you. By faith or by faith? So let's see. We've got a Jew and a Greek here. How is God going to justify them? Well, you've got two choices. Faith or faith. That's it. You know, some people think, well, the Jews, they have to keep God's law, but the Gentiles don't have to. No. It's all the same thing. It's all by faith. Just like Abraham was saved by faith. Romans chapter 4. Turn you to Romans chapter 10. We're almost done. This is, um, this is my last page of notes and we're halfway done. So we're, we're, we're almost done. I know I got a lot of stuff. Man, we blew through that pretty good. Romans chapter 10. See, but aren't the Jews a special people? Look at verse number 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is no difference you would underline that. There is no difference. No difference between the Jew and the Greek. Turn through to Matthew chapter 3. I'm just going to read a couple more references for you. Galatians 3, 28. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. We saw that already. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Romans 10. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Matthew 3, look at verse number 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That was John the Baptist preaching to the Pharisees and to the Jews at that time. Why would he say that? Because they actually thought that it mattered that they were physically descended from Abraham. That's what they were partially what they were trusting in. They claimed to trust in the law, but they also trusted in their genealogy. They trusted in, well, we're a descendant of Abraham. We have those promises of God, even though they didn't listen to him at all. They thought that those were theirs. And it's funny because people say, oh, you replacement theology people, you're, you're uh, promise stealers or something, right? They say, like, you're trying to steal a promise. Look, I'm not trying to steal anything. I just believe what the Bible says, that I get to receive the blessings of Abraham through faith. Amen. And that if God wants to raise up children unto Abraham, he could use stones. That means nothing. I'm going to close with John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse number 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God's chosen people. God's people. Who are God's people? Those that have faith. Those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are God's people. And any nation that's going to bring forth and promote the Word of God and trust in the Word of God, that nation's going to be blessed. And that will be the nation who are called the people of God. God's holy nation. God's people. And that could change. That is not static in any way. That can move around. That has nothing to do with any, physic any genealogy. So hopefully you understand this a little better. We saw this morning you know, a lot of the negative aspects and in, in in just the... Um, really into the character of who the Jews were in Jesus' day and, and how you know, the, the religion is an anti-Christ religion and it's people who reject Jesus Christ that will have nothing to do with him. And uh, this evening, we're, we looked at a lot of places that talk about who God's people were, his chosen people. Why did God choose Abraham? Because he, he had faith and he obeyed him. He made promise to Abraham because of all the good works he did. He chose a people to... to give his word unto, to, to try to lead, to be a lighthouse in a dark world, to, to bring his light to, to where people can, can go to that light and they can distribute that word unto the whole world. That was the purpose. He had to use somebody. Why not use and start off with somebody who's doing that work right away? That's what he did. He also needed to prophesy the coming of Jesus Christ so that people could know it's the word of God. That's how God works. That's how he's always worked. He uses prophecy. He says, this is going to happen, and then it does come to happen. You know, it does come to pass. Everything that God says, it's a proof of who he is and that he is the true God. Because when he says something, when he prophesies something, it is without fail comes to pass. Every single time. So he needed to prophesy the coming of the Savior, of the just one, and he did it many times over. But he had to reveal that to somebody. He revealed it unto the people that he chose where his name was going to be placed there. Those people, ultimately, as a group, as a whole, rejected him. Now there is a remnant that was saved. Thank God for that. It's great, but as a whole, the whole group, that nation rejected him. They are no longer God's holy people. They are no longer God's chosen people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching from your word. God, I pray that you would please just help us to um, 
Continue to read the Bible in context, dear Lord. Help us all to be bold and not to be afraid or shy away from preaching any truth, but that we would rather shout it from the housetops, dear Lord. I don't care what's popular these days and what isn't, Lord. Um, I, I just care about what's right and what's wrong. I care about what you, you teach and what your word says. Lord, we pray and we beg you just to open up our understanding even more every single day, dear Lord, as we read your word, as we hear from it. God, help us to just increase our learning, increase our doctrine, and um, help us to, to leave tonight, even if, especially people who have already come to this truth, they know this knowledge, dear Lord, help us to walk away tonight with, with an added uh, understanding and with the, the scriptural references to be able to give an answer unto those that are confused by this doctrine or that, that um, would attack this doctrine, Lord, so that they would be better equipped to defend your word and the truth from your word uh, using scripture. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.